Very early in the morning of the 14th of February 2013, Oscar Pretorius, the famous athlete, shot and killed his girlfriend Riva Steenkamp, a well-known model. Using his own gun, he fired four shots through the door of a toilet that led off the bathroom in his upmarket property where they were spending the night. Three of the shots hit Riva and she died of multiple gunshot shot wounds. This all happened in the Pretoria suburb of Silver Lakes. There's no doubt that Pistorius fired the shots and that they caused the death of Riva. But from the beginning Pistorius claimed he had thought he was firing at an intruder who had entered through the bathroom window and that the death of Riva was a terrible accident. On the other hand, the prosecution contended that after an argument between the couple, Pistorius had in anger drawn a weapon and gunned her down. Did Pistorius intend her death, or did he in fact think he was acting to defend himself and Riva? Given the fame of Pistorius, there was worldwide media attention in his trial for the murder of Riva Steenkamp. The crucial issue in that trial was whether Pistorius intended to kill Riva. Thus it came about that the South African law on the mental element in murder became a matter of intense worldwide interest. That law is rather different to the mental element required for a conviction for murder in England and in many other common law sy systems, and it is plain that the South African law puzzled many commentators. This video attempts some explanation in the interests of clarity. The first point to make is that in South African law there was from the 1930s to the 1980s a movement often called the purism movement that sought to systematize the legal system so that each rule fitted into a single logically coherent framework of legal principle. The movement was in reaction to the influence of English law on South African law during the previous century. English law was often considered by the purists to be overly pragmatic and unprincipled. The purism movement was fueled by vigorous academic debate and was spectacularly successful in many areas. And one of the most obvious of those successes was in the reform of the law relating to the mental element for crime in general and murder in particular. The justification for punishment is the fault of the accused was the purest, purest starting point. So if the accused did not intend to commit the crime with which he was charged, he is not at fault and should not be convicted. He did not have the guilty mind or mens rea as it is put in Latin. So to bring home a murder verdict, the prosecution would need to show that Pistorius intended to kill. Moreover, it should be stressed that that intention was to be tested entirely subjectively. The prosecution needed to show beyond reasonable doubt that the intent was in fact present in Pistorius's mind. It was not enough that he should have foreseen the death, he had in fact to foresee it. The transformation of mens rea into an entirely subjective concept is the great achievement of purism in the field of criminal law. I mentioned just in passing that there's one large exception at South African common law to the subjectivity of mens rea. The offence of culpable homicide in which the fault element is culpa or the failure to exhibit the care of a reasonable man in guarding against the death of another. Anyway, to return to the purists, they rejected a proposition that had earlier been adopted in some South African cases. This was that a person who intentionally committed an unlawful act was criminally responsible for all the consequences that followed from it. For instance, in the 1920 case of Wallendorf, the accused persons assaulted a policeman but didn't know that he was a policeman. They were convicted of resisting a policeman in the, in the performance of his duty and this was upheld on appeal. The appeal judge said that mens rea is present here for the evidence that is, is clear that whether or not the accused were aware of the fact that Mooney was a constable, they were guilty of an assault upon him. 
A person who deliberately breaks the law must take the risk of his offence turning out to be of a more serious nature than he had intended. Such views were anathema to the purists. One is here punishing someone for a crime which they did not intend to commit, contrary to the principle that the justification for punishment is the fault of the accused. But pause for a moment at the English law of mens rea for murder. The mental element here required is either the intention to kill or an intention to cause really serious bodily harm. Now a purist has great difficulty with the intention to cause serious, serious bodily harm as the mens rea for murder. It means, to use the example given by Lord Edmund Davies in the case of Cunningham in 1982, a person can be convicted of murder if death results from him, from say his intentional breaking of, his, of another's arm. An action, while calling for severe punishment, would in most cases be unlikely to kill. There is no intent to kill, yet there is an in conviction for murder. It is examples like this one that cause the purists to say rude, rude things about the unprincipled English law. Anyway, in South Africa the purists with their judicial allies prevailed and the Vasari Doctrine, the Latin name for the principle that the mens rea from one crime can be transferred to another, was rejected altogether from the law. The phrase transferred malice is often used for this concept in English law. This all happened in 1965 in a case called Bernardus, the facts of which don't need not concern us, but where the then Chief Justice laid down that to convict a person without proving that he was at fault in regard to the crime charged was contrary to basic fairness. We have thus far simply taken the question of the nature of intention for granted. In English law, the accused intends a certain criminal consequence if that was his aim and object. He is also taken to intend that consequence if, although not his aim or object, he foresees that consequence as certain or substantially certain to result from his conduct. South African law uses a wider concept of intention. It includes both the states of mind just described as intention, but then goes further. An accused will intend the death of R if he foresees the possibility of R's death resulting from his conduct and yet he continues with that conduct. This is so-called dolus eventualis, also called legal intention, that has been much talked about, which has been much talked about in commentaries on the Pistorius case. It means simply to take a conscious risk with the life of another. If the accused foresees that his conduct might cause the death of another and yet continues, there is dolus eventualis and if death results he is guilty of murder. It has of course to be shown that the accused in fact foresaw the possibility of death and yet proceeded. It is not enough that injury is foreseen, death must be foreseen, and it is not enough that a reasonable person in the accused position would have foreseen the risk of death, the accused must have had that state of mind himself. Now let us return to the Pistorius trial and the judgment of Miss Justice Matsipa. After a very careful analysis of the evidence of when the shots were fired and when screaming and shooting was heard by the neighbours, the judge concluded, having regard to the onus of proof which rested throughout on the prosecution, that Pistorius's account, that he had got up from the bed suspecting an intruder and fired at the toilet door believing Reaver to be still in the bedroom, might reasonably be true. This was obviously a crucial finding and it rests upon the judge's thorough analysis of the often contradictory evidence of those who heard the shots and screams. But the witness's phone records gave precise and reliable timings and were a crucial part of the judge's assessment. The effect of this finding 
was to undermine the prosecution's primary case that after an argument with Reva, she had fled to the toilet and he had deliberately followed and fired through the door. But that was not the end of the tale. The prosecution might have failed to satisfy the court that, Reva, that Pistorius, when he fired, had as his aim and object the death of Reva. But what about Dolus Eventualis? Well, it is difficult for an accused not suffering from some mental incapacity to fire four shots into a door behind which there be was believed to be an intruder without foreseeing at least the possibility of that that might cause death. The defence argued that since Pistorius thought that Reva was still in the bedroom, he could not foresee the possibility of her death and so could not be guilty of her murder. The prosecution responded that it made no difference whether he foresaw the possibility that the shots would cause death of Reva or the hypothetical intruder, to which the defence's response was this, that this would be to revive the Vasari transferred malice doctrine, which as we have seen was firmly rejected from South African law on the grounds of fundamental principle. If Pristorius was to be guilty of the murder of Reva, then he had to have intended to kill Reva. In one of the clearest and most impressive parts of her judgment, Matsipa J rejected this argument. She said this. On the other hand, counsel for the defence submitted that the state was attempting to reintroduce the concept of transferred malice which was not part of our law. That brings the question whether we are really dealing with a question of transfer mal transferred malice. It might be convenient at this stage to say something briefly about two concepts which are often confused. And I say as an aside, these have Latin names for which I apologise. Aberratio ictus and error in objecto. The judge goes on, Aberratio ictus means the going astray of the blow. In aberratio ictus, A intends to kill B, but misses him and kills C. It follows that A has intention in respect of C only if he foresees or foresaw the possibility of C's death, in which case he would be guilty of murder, dolus eventualis. On the other hand, there is error in objecto. I think the judge might have been more accurate to speak of error in persona, but let's adopt her terminology, error in objecto. It means where A, intending to kill B, shoots and kills C, whom he mistakenly believes to be B. In these circumstances, A is clearly guilty of the murder of C. His intention is directed at a specific predetermined individual, although he is in error as to the exact identity of that individual. In other words, A intends to kill the individual irrespective of whether the name of the individual is B or C. There is thus in the case of errors in objecto an undeflected mens rea which falls upon the person it was intended to affect. The error as to the identity of the individual therefore is not relevant to the question of mens rea. My view, the judge continues, is that we are here dealing, not dealing with aberratio ictus as there was no deflection of the blow. It is therefore, it would therefore serve no purpose to say anything more about it. We are clearly dealing with error in objecto, in that the blow was meant for the person behind the toilet door, who the accused believed to be an intruder. The blow struck and killed the person behind the door the fact that the person behind the door turned out to be the deceased and not an intruder is irrelevant. This passage that I've just read from the ju judgment of the judge is a very clear but entirely orthodox account of the relevant South African law. But now, and this is the curious part, the judge turns to consider the question of whether the Pistorius had dolus eventualis when he fired at the toilet door. 
We are here approaching the crucial reasoning that led to Pistorius' acquittal on the murder charge. She says this, I now deal with dolus eventualis or legal intent. The question is, one, did the accused subjectively foresee that it could be the deceased behind the toilet door? And B, notwithstanding the foresight, did he then fire the shots, thereby reconciling himself to the possibility that it could be the deceased in the toilet? The evidence before this court does not support the state's contention that this was a case of dolus eventualis. On the contrary, the evidence shows that from the onset the accused believed that at the time he fired the shots into the toilet door, the deceased was in the bedroom while the intruders were in the toilet. This belief was communicated to a number of people shortly after the incident. Did the fo accused foresee the possibility of the resultant death, yet persisted in his de deed, reckless whether death ensued or not? In the circumstances of this case, the answer has to be no. How could the accused reasonably have foreseen that the shots he fired would kill the deceased. Clearly he did not subjectively foresee this as a possibility that he, he would kill the person let, behind the door, let alone the deceased, as she thought she was in the bedroom at the time. Bistorius's acquittal on the murder charge follows. This is a real po puzzle. It seems that the judge had accepted the defense's argument that to be guilty of murder Pistorius must have foreseen Reva's death. It was not enough that he foresaw the death of an intruder, or whoever it might be, behind the door. But this is just the argument she has so clearly rejected. A mistake as to the identity of the victim is not relevant to the question of mens rea, to quote the very word she used. Pistorius, having been acquitted of the murder charge, was of course found guilty on the alternative charge of culpable homicide. This followed readily from the fact that a reasonable man in his position, testing it objectively, would not have fired through the door as he did. The prosecution has obtained leave to appeal to the Supreme Court and the appeal will be heard early in 2015. I have not seen the grounds of appeal but would be surprised if dolus eventualis did not feature str strongly along with the distinction between aberratio ictus and error in personam. Criminal cases such as this one often bring personal tragedy to the public eye and trials are fraught with emotion and sensation. It is right that the evidence should be carefully and coldly weighed and the unemotional and acute analysis of the evidence by Justice Matsipe is impressive. Whether she was right or wrong in her application of the law of dolus eventualis, her judgment stands as a bulwark against the waves of sympathy for Pistorius founded in his celebrity and on the other hand the waves of anger at yet another unnecessary and pointless death of a young woman at the hands of one who should have protected her.